Thank you. That's an excellent double barrel question. Um, we have people who are very insistent that it's improper to refer to the full seven years as the tribulation. Some of the reasons for this are, although not correct, understandable. They're trying to avoid the errors of pre-tribulationism, where pre-tribulationists simply equate the Great Tribulation with the time of Jacob's trouble, with uh, the 70th week of Daniel. It's all the same thing to them, and they're trying to avoid that error. So they become more specific. But we don't correct error with error. Let's understand the basis of this issue and this problem. Similarly, the Holy Spirit. Moriel and myself, we've never taught that the Holy Spirit is taken from believers or from individuals. We simply say he's taken from his function in convicting the world. He is in a position now where he is restraining evil, and he is doing it in various ways by convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, empowering and uniting the church to preach the gospel and so forth. That function of the Holy Spirit will stop, and God will turn his grace back towards Israel and the Jews. One of the problems that pre-tribulation people have is they talk a lot about tribulation saints. Well, how can people be saved in the tribulation if the Holy Spirit is completely taken? Well, he's not. He simply functions in the way he did in the Old Testament. Once again, we've explained this many times. When that seven-year period begins, God reverts to behaving, dealing with man, the way he did in the Old Testament. He refocuses his purpose on Israel and the Jews, particularly after the church is raptured and resurrection, re resurrected. That is to say, not the church per se, the church won't exist, but the faithful believers who are here after the shattering of the power of the holy people will be removed. Then God is really focused on Israel. But we're told in Zechariah 12, his spirit will be outpoured again. There will be a special Pentecost, as it were, for Israel and the Jews in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, referred to in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. I will pour it on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look upon me who they have pierced, crucified, and mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and weep bitterly like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. This relates in part to the prophecies of the prophet Joel, but in Zechariah chapter 12, it's Revelation chapter 1. God will pour out his spirit on Israel, but Pentecost, as it were, concerning the church, is reversed. That does not mean that the Holy Spirit is not here. Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Remember, when Jesus rose from the dead, when the apostles were born again, in John chapter 20, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. At that point, the apostles were regenerate. They were born again. The Messiah had died and risen. Now they were born again. But he told them, Go wait in Jerusalem for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of God's people is permanent. But the outpouring is reversed. The church will not exist per se. It'll be the state of things before the day of Pentecost. It'll be disunited, having no power, basically an underground movement, except there's no unity in it. And they will know who the son of perdition is. They will know who the Antichrist is, the same as the apostles knew who the son of perdition was. They knew who Judas Iscariot was. That happens again. But that's not to say his spirit is taken from the hearts of individuals. It was not. God's spirit was indwelling the apostles at that period, and his spirit will continue to indwell faithful believers after the Holy Spirit no longer restrains Satan, the wicked one, the Antichrist from coming to power. It doesn't say he's taken or goes away per se. It says that he stops restraining he stops restraining. As it were, Jesus went and sent the Spirit. The Spirit goes and sent Jesus. But he doesn't depart from the hearts of believers. What happened between the Ascension and Pentecost happens again. There is that period.
period of time, the shattering of the power of the holy people. Work while you have the light. Night will come. No man can work. The apostles could not evangelize during that time. However, God was working in a special way. He began working through Israel and the Jews again. Something is going to happen concerning Israel. Again, those same judgments we see in the book of Exodus are replayed in the book of Revelation. Although Pentecost is reversed, God will pour out his spirit on Israel, as we read about in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Now, to understand these things, the ministry and function of the Holy Spirit, what he does now, and what he's not going to do once he stops restraining, we need to look to the New Testament passage where Jesus explains this. Also to understand about the last seven years and the beginning of birth patterns, the first half, when the seals are broken, the first four seals, we have to go to that same passage. Can we look, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16. John, chapter 16. We've said a number of times that because John's Gospel has no account of the Olivet Discourse, it doesn't have the equivalent or a parallel p passage of Matthew 24 and 25 or of Luke 21 or of Mark 13. It doesn't have that in John. The last day's teaching of John is found in a different way. John's Gospel is punctuated with end times references. It's punctuated. But those end times references are crucial. We must also bear in mind that in his epistles, particularly 1 John, John speaks of the last days and the advent of Antichrist focally. And it is this same John who wrote the Gospel, who was chosen by God to author the book of Revelation, which primarily deals with the last days and the return of Jesus and what follows it. This is John. John is very, very eschatological. He is very, very focused on end-time prophecy, but because there's no Olivet Discourse in John, Christians tend to not look for end-time material in John. This is a big, big mistake. John is rife with end-time material. It's just that it is not there in the form of an extended discourse, as you have in Matthew 24 and 25. Let's look at John chapter 16 please. Let's begin with the Holy Spirit. Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit as the paracletos, the paraclete, the comforter, the one who gets next to us and encourages us. We'll begin in verse 5. But now I'm going to him who sent me, that is the Father, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I had said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world. Eklente, eklente. Um, this idea of um, convicting, but also exposing, exposing. He will convict and expose sin for what it is. And he goes on and he says this. He comes to convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. Let's take these three things. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Jesus was the perfect man. He was God who became a man, fully human and fully divine. He was righteousness incarnate. He is our righteousness, Tzidkatenu. In the absence of Jesus being here physically and personally, as he was and as he will be again during the millennial reign, the Holy Spirit is the surrogate who fulfills that function in place of Jesus. One of the Antichrist doctrines, again, Antichrist in place of Christ in Greek, 
of the Roman Church puts the papacy in place of the Holy Spirit. It's a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who's the true vicar of Christ, not the Pope. The Holy Spirit behaves vicariously on behalf of Jesus. That's the first. Concerning sin. But then he goes on uh, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you no longer see me. Yeshua Tzidkatenu. Jesus is our righteousness. We have no righteousness of our own. But he's not here. Yet we are the body of Christ. The righteousness of Christ is made in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. Let's continue. But then he goes on, convicting the world this way. Okay. And then the third thing it says is, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Satan was defeated on the cross and in the resurrection. He didn't know it at first. He thought he was victorious. But the resurrection proved it was a gambit. I've got your rook. No, I've got your queen checkmate. It was a setup. The Lord outfoxed him. God outfoxed the devil with the resurrection. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. There it is. Okay. The Son of Man came that the works of Satan will be destroyed. Satan knows this. Notice it puts the emphasis on the devil himself. It tells us, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. These three functions will cease. The Holy Spirit will not empower the church anymore to preach the gospel. God will turn his focus back to Israel and prepare the faithful believers to be raptured out of here once the bride is dressed and ready, purified from the worldliness that has contaminated the sin. The Lord will make use of the persecution to purify the bride because the church has become so corrupted in the last days. Only the true church is what he wants. Now this will mean the blood of martyrs, as it always has done. But the blood of martyrs has always been the road to victory, not defeat, ultimately. Only the true believers will be willing to die for Jesus. Those who love this world and trust in it will not be. They'll compromise as they always have. Now let's continue to look at this. The world will not be convicted anymore. Evil will not be restrained. God's Spirit will only be for His own people. However, His Spirit will be poured out again on Israel. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And the one-third of the Jews who see and believe will certainly be saved. Uh, and some others, at least some others, if we read Zechariah chapters um, 12 and 13. This projects ahead, of course, into the book of Revelation as well. So nobody has ever said from Moriel that the Holy Spirit will be taken from the hearts of true believers. He will simply be taken in the sense he will no longer restrain. He'll be taken from the world. God's spirit will no longer strive with man. He says his spirit will not <coughs> forever strive with man. But now let's look further down to the end, verse 33. These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have peace. Philipsis, tribulation. But take courage, I've overcome the world. Tribulation is a general term. It means pressure that comes from constriction. Pressure that comes from constriction. This is tribulation. In the parable of the sower and the seed, we see tribulation because of the word. In the seven churches of Revelation, we see Jesus speaking of them having tribulation. In John chapter 1, John co-suffered, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1, John co-suffered tribulation with the believers, as did Paul. Tribulation in a general sense. 
But tribulation multiplies, increases in intensity in the last days. Once the seven year period commences, something happens. The last seven years are broken into four primary stages. The first is called the beginning of birth pangs. The beginning of birth pangs. Remember, Scripture, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Revelation, continually uses birth pangs to illustrate what's going to happen. Just as in maternal labor, there may be interim periods of respite, but then the contractions come back much more intensely than they had been until the baby is finally born. You go from, as it were, the ellipsis to macro the ellipsis, from tribulation to great tribulation until the baby's finally born. This is illustrated for us in the book of Revelation chapter 12. The woman is in travail, but when the dragon comes and stands in front of the woman to devour her baby, but the baby is caught up in the Greek harpezo, raptured. The dragon becomes enraged and goes to make war with the rest of her offspring. Once Satan fails to prevent the rapture by killing all the believers, although he kills many of them, he turns against the Jews. The woman's in travail. That's birth pangs. The beginning of birth pangs. But when the dragon stands in front of her to kill the baby, that's great birth pangs. She's already in tribulation, but it becomes a progressively worsening situation to the great tribulation. Just think of natural maternal labor. Now there's much more that can be said about Revelation chapter 12. Again, the dragon with seven heads and ten horns comes from the book of Daniel. It has to do with the kingdom of Antichrist, and it tells us the political entities from Europe and so forth that Satan is going to use to persecute the true church. Nonetheless, let's continue looking at this from John chapter 16. So we have the ellipsis, tribulation in a general sense. But in John 16, verses 20 to 22, Jesus speaks in a last days format. He speaks of the last days. This is what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain, because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away. Maternal contractions are dreadful things, but once you have a healthy, beautiful baby boy or baby girl, the joy quickly watches the birth pangs and their after effects dissipate to nothing. You forget about it. All you're focused on is the joy. That is what it's going to be like when Jesus comes. The suffering of the church, the persecution will dissipate to nothing when the joy of being with him is manifested to the faithful believers. But now let's look very carefully again at verse 21. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come, but when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish. That term anguish in Greek is the lipsis, tribulation. Notice the entire birth pang process is referred to by Jesus as the lipsis, as tribulation. Now let's look at Matthew chapter 24 in relation to this. Jesus says the following, beginning in verse 4. See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and mislead many. You'll be hearing of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. Those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. 
For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are the mere beginning of birth pangs. These things that Jesus describes in verses 4, 5, 6, and 7 correspond to the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the first four seals in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, beginning with the Antichrist. Jesus comes on a white horse, as it were, in Revelation 19. Antichrist counterfeits this by coming on a white horse in Revelation 6. He tries to persuade people that he's the messianic redeemer figure of some kind. He counterfeits Christ, coming before Christ. We see Jesus on the white horse in Revelation 19, but Revelation 6, the first horseman, is Antichrist. Followed by the wars, the pestilence, the famines, these are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The fifth seal begins the persecution of the church. That is the period where Satan tries to prevent the rapture through the person and agency of Antichrist and his cohorts by wiping out those who are going to be raptured, corresponding directly to Revelation chapters 12, verses 1 through 3. Now let's look at this. But all these things are the mere beginning of birth pangs. In John 16, Jesus describes the birth pangs corporately, collectively, as tribulation. He calls it all thalipsis. Thus, it is not at all improper to refer to the full period as the tribulation. What we must do, however, is draw a distinction between tribulation <coughs> and great tribulation. In verse 9 of Matthew 24, we see a shift. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. Now we're going from tribulation to great tribulation. It's not just focused on the world or the planet collectively or corporately. Now there's something specifically directed against believers. We continue reading this in verse 21 of Matthew 24. For then there'll be a great tribulation. The ellipsis macro, macro the ellipsis, the great tribulation. Just like birth pangs, they begin and get progressively worse. But you reach a point where they become unbearable. In an obstetric situation, once labor goes on beyond 24 hours, and the mother is being traumatized, and there's a risk of congenital or antenatal damage to the fetus, <coughs> obstetricians will frequently elect for a cesarean section, a surgical incision. The Greek word for this would be kolobo. It's like an amputation. God surgically intervenes to get the baby out. Well, this is what the rapture is. For the sake of the elect, those days are cut short. Matthew 24 shows us there's a difference between tribulation, that is the beginning of birth pangs, and great tribulation. But in John 16, Jesus refers to the entire thing as thalipsis, or thalipsin, depending on the case, I think, as tribulation. Those who say, no, there's no difference between tribulation and great tribulation, are mistaken. And those who say, no, the tribulation is only in the second half, are completely mistaken. Jesus plainly referred to the entire period <coughs> as tribulation. But it is not all the Great Tribulation. That period is broken down into the beginning of birth pangs. That's the first stage of Tribulation. Then at the Great Tribulation. The intensity just before the man-child, the baby comes. Before the rapture. After the rapture, God pours out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist and refocuses on the redemption of Israel. That is the day of the Lord. There it is not a matter of tribulation. It is no longer thalipsis. It becomes something very different than thalipsis. Orge, 
the wrath of God is poured out on the kingdom of Antichrist, and his focus goes back to the Jews. At the end of this, there is a transition into the millennial kingdom, where there will be some sort of geographical and environmental transformation back to an Adamic state, as described in the book of Ezekiel, the second half of Ezekiel describes the way Jerusalem and Israel will look at that particular period during the millennial reign of Jesus. Those are the stages and the phases. But it is not wrong to refer to the entire seven years, or, or the beginning of it, the first half, certainly the first half, as the ellipsis. Jesus does. In John 16, he even calls the, the birth pangs, the beginning of birth pangs, are called the ellipsis, tribulation. It's when we get to Matthew 24, we see the distinction between tribulation and great tribulation. The wrath of God goes beyond that. It's well beyond tribulation. It's something entirely different. True believers will never experience the wrath of God, but they will, up to a point, experience the tribulation of Satan. Jesus told the church in Smyrna, Satan will put you in prison ten days. You will have the dipsis, tribulation, ten days. Do not believe the myth of pre-tribulationism. Neither, however, should you believe that the tribulation is only in the second half. No. The great tribulation comes into play at a later point in the seven years. But not tribulation. Jesus referred to it all as tribulation, even the beginning of birth pangs. He uses the term thalipsis inclusively in John chapter 16, verses 20 to 22. There are also those who suggest, or have suggested, that Antichrist only comes into play at the halfway point through the seven years when he's enthroned in the temple. He's on the scene long before that. He's in the first seal at the beginning of the seven years. He comes on the white horse counterfeiting Jesus at the beginning. Again, think of Judas Iscariot. The apostles did not know he was the son of perdition. Only Jesus did. But he was there on the scene. He was a player in the scenario long before his true identity and true agenda were revealed. The same will be true of Antichrist. He comes on the white horse at the beginning of the seven years in some way, even though people do not understand who he actually is in his full agenda as yet. The faithful certainly will once Jesus reveals it. This idea of being enthroned in the temple <coughs> obviously has a specific importance for Israel and the Jews. They will have been betrayed and realized what they've gotten themselves into. Having rejected the true Messiah, they have, in effect, will have followed a false one. But that is also an alarm for the church. That tells us imminency has become a reality. Now that you know who the Antichrist is, now there's a real imminency. Jesus is coming very, very soon, prepared to leave during this period of great tribulation. We are rescued between the sixth and seventh seal during the interlude in Revelation chapter 7. Now it's with good reason that this term, the nipsis, is used as an obstetric term. Because, again, its etymology is of a pressure caused by constriction. As it were, contraction, the same as in maternal labor. To conclude, once again, the beginning of birth pangs that take place at the beginning of the seven years correspond to the first four seals. After the first four seals, we shift from tribulation into great tribulation, where Satan begins to increasingly target believers in his attempt to prevent the rapture. Tribulation, great tribulation. The ellipsis with the ellipsin, the ellipsis macro, or macro to ellipsis. You must make that distinction. It is true to say that 
the Makroth ellipsis, the Great Tribulation, is into the seven years at a later point, following the beginning of birth pangs. But it is wrong to say that we should not call the beginning of birth pangs the ellipsis, tribulation. Jesus refers to the birth pangs collectively, inclusively, in John chapter 16, verse 21, as tribulation. In reacting to the errors of pre-tribulationism, some people have begun saying some seriously irresponsible and biblically untenable things on certain blog sites. They are people who basically may mean well, but they don't know what they're talking about. Um, I and others have been misquoted, or things we've said have been taken out of the context we said them, and they've ascribed to me and to Moriel things we don't even believe or teach. Uh, there's a big danger of people, and not all of them are women, although many are. All they do is go back and forth on the internet blogging all day. I wish they would spend more time witnessing. I wish they would spend more time doing something for the persecuted church. I wish they would spend more time studying the Word of God before they attempt to elucidate about it without knowing what they're talking about. I wish they would spend more time preparing the way for the coming of Jesus instead of imagining they are by blabbing nonsense when they don't even know what they're saying. This idea that tribulation is only later and it, there's no difference between tribulation and great tribulation is patent nonsense. Jesus referred to the entire birth pang process as a period of tribulation. But just as in maternal labor, you've got the trauma, and then you've got the hyper-trauma prior to delivery. Same thing. You have birth pangs, which are tribulation. Jesus called it thalipsis. But then you have macro -thalipsis, great tribulation, just before the man-child is born. It is not wrong to refer to the first half as also a period of tribulation. As long as we distinguish between tribulation and great tribulation, which the pre-trib people unfortunately fail to do. At our book, Harpezo, we go into these things at much greater length. I hope that you will be able to read that book. It's available on Amazon, it's available on Kindle, and so forth, where you can obtain it through the Moria website, etc. My name is James Jacob Prash. I'm in England at the moment. Thank you so much, and God bless.